Welcome back to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Stephen Dozman. How are we to conceive of acts that suddenly expose the injustice of the current order? This is a question that has puzzled philosophers for centuries, and it's the question of my guest today, Dominic Finkeld, and he is here to discuss it with his book, Excessive Subjectivity, Kant, Hegel, Lacan, and the Foundation of Ethics, from Columbia University Press in 2017. The book looks at these three major thinkers in the ways they saw subjects as being immersed in a particular set of ethical orientations, but also always with a subtle but profound potential to do something beyond what they might have thought possible. Dominic Finkeld is a professor of contemporary political philosophy and epistemology at the Munich School of Philosophy, and is also the author of Zizek Between Lacan and Hegel and Benjamin Reed's Proust. So, Dominic Finkeld, welcome to the New Books Network. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so, we always like to kind of have our guests introduce themselves. So, could you maybe tell us a bit about who you are and what your main research interests tend to be? Uh, well, as you said, I teach here in Munich at uh, the Munich School of Philosophy and in the areas of epistemology and contemporary philosophy, especially contemporary political philosophy. Uh, I grew up in Berlin and also studied there philosophy and critical theory or uh, comparative literature at the university. Then I wrote my PhD in Munich on the topic that you mentioned, Benjamin, it was uh, on Walter Benjamin, it uh, was a topic on the philosophy of language of Benjamin, and uh, I was analyzing the way Marcel Proust had an impact on, on Benjamin. And uh, well, then I wrote my habilitation. So the, the, the second big book, I also published smaller books, the one you mentioned on Zizek, also a little book on the debate on Paul the Apostle and political philosophy. But for me, the most important book in the last years uh, was Excessive Subjectivity. And uh, I published this uh, several years ago. And uh, since uh, four or five years, I'm here professor at the Munich Faculty um, of Philosophy. Wonderful. So to kick things off, in the beginning of the book, you point to a contradiction in Kant's life, where on the one hand, he expressed some admiration for those in the French Revolution, but at the same time argued that revolutionaries ought to be universally condemned. You jump off of this to discuss the gap between the thinker's freedom and the subject's duty. Can you speak to this tension a bit and how it sets up your own project here? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, thanks for the question because it goes right into the topic of the of the book. Uh, I think everybody in the academic community knows that uh, Kant is not a philosopher who favors favors revolutions. He is seen as the philosopher of duty to the moral law, to the moral law but also to the state. So. Uh, in front of this background, it is rather surprising that Kant, in a famous text, The Conflict of the Faculties, expresses somehow respect and esteem for the revolution, French revolution, since he says that seen from afar, from Germany to France, it can provoke esteem because uh, we have the impression there's really a progress of, of normativity to, to be contemplated. But this esteem for the revolution stands somehow in contrast to what he writes in the Metaphysics of Morals, that revolutionaries must be universally condemned by the law. And this is too, truly surprising. How can you combine these two different perspectives? How can you look from distance with enthusiasm to a revolution, but immediately, so when you zoom into the revolution, then you see peoples or revolutionaries that have, that have, polemically speaking, have to be sent to the gallows. So it appears as if Kant wants a revolution without revolutionaries. And what I like in this paradox is Kant's own struggle with normativity, because when he defends the moral law as an absolute call that must be obeyed, even when the consequences are horrible for the individual, but also for other, uh, then he, uh, this is one part of his um, moral philosophy. But then we have this other part that uh, he defends the political status quo by all means. Uh, and I think this paradox is, for me, the starting point um, how can Kant have both opinions? So somehow focus on what I would call excessive subjectivity, somehow the bizarre art of an individual or a group to declare a subjective state of emergency 
because I think this is somehow also in as a part of Kant's concept of the the moral law. But as I said, it's um, it stands in contrast to uh, his defense of the status quo and the defense of this of this of the state by all means. Uh, Okay, but, but to, uh, to make this point once more clear, because even when we, when Kant wants to send the revolutionaries to the gallows, he himself presents us in his philosophy with a moral, with a moral will that is so radical that, for example, uh, Hegel, in a very famous quote, says that the, Kant, the Kantian concept of the moral conscience is co-responsible for the French Revolution, and I think this is a little bit the key argument of my of, of my first chapter on Kant. This paradox, when, when, when Hegel himself says, well, Kant's moral philosophy is so radical, we have to take it into account. It is, it is, it is, it is somehow the centerpiece of the, radical, uh, of the radicality of the French Revolution. But on the other hand, we don't see that, we don't see Kant as the one who really can give a theory for this. Uh, yeah, okay, and this is a little bit the starting point to get into Kant and to uh, to, to give an answer to this paradox. How, how can we have this radical Kant on the one hand and this, uh, and this somehow blind defender of the status quo of the state? Yeah, it sets up a really interesting tension. Uh, turning briefly to Hegel, you discuss what you call the paradox of autonomy, a problem Hegel received from both Kant and Rousseau. Can you explain the paradox here? Uh, well, yeah. Well, the paradox of autonomy refers back, to, I think, to a paradox that we all know. For example, the paradox how to educate children, our children, so that they can be free and self-determining citizens or human beings. Uh, though exactly this education in being free has to be organized and done by others. So this is, I think, maybe the basic argument of the paradox of, of autonomy. Uh, how can you be trained by others to be free, a free agent uh, and a free agent of also of your deeds and especially of moral acts? Or said differently, how can you be part of society where society th somehow throws you under the bus of you know, what, the, the, what normativity, what's, what's the established status of normativity, but at the same time um, society wants you to accept this normativity that, that you are thrown under the bus of? And, set, and accept so freely. Uh, remember that, for, that Rousseau, and this is where this paradox somehow comes from, that Rousseau uh, sees in modern society, as a radically speaking, or a, a little bit cliche, cliche like speaking, pure evil, and he imagines, therefore, in his novel Emil uh, or on education, how we have, you, how we have to educate uh, the, the next generation so that they are not. Continuing the corruption that uh, that Rousseau sees in his in his surrounding, then and again you see the you see the paradox. So how can we educate people so that they change society? But we have to educate them from from within society. And uh, and then you could say we have the, the German Enlightenment authors like Lessing or Schiller or Herder. They try to circumvent this paradox when they say. Well, of course, yeah, we have to uh, we have to educate them in aesthetics, for example. Then aesthetics becomes the big uh, the big theoretical field of of research, because the Germans would like to evade the French Revolution, but nevertheless see also the need for for the education of mankind, uh, so that a revolution that a, a French Revolution does not repeat itself. And I would say that Kant sticks somehow to this paradox, also. He, because he maintains, and this is also very central to his, uh, to his moral philosophy, that morality cannot be trained. We can educate people, but uh, morality is, is beyond education. Uh, this, does not, this does not exclude education, of course. Education is also for Kant a very necessary condition of morality, but it is not a sufficient condition. So morality is for, for Kant somehow uh, a category of exception of excess of too muchness. And this is also, of course, for my argument, very important. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, now Hegel comes yeah, along. You're fine. Um, he, to turn to the... Yeah. Oh. Uh, I wanted to continue, but... Sorry, uh, I can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yep. 
Well, now okay, now we have Hegel who comes along and uh, Hegel criticizes Kant's radicality on the one hand. He also says, uh, well, Kant is a little bit too formalistic in his understanding. We need, of course, society. We need the context uh, of society so that, okay, human beings can have inclinations, that they have a feeling for the moral law. It doesn't have to be abstract. But on the other hand, uh, Hegel also says, well, this is this is brilliant what Kant presents us to. Well, this is... Uh, this is beautiful because it's, it's it's the radicality of Kant that uh, that that Hegel on the on the other on the other side accepts as so so important. Uh, so, so this also also very this is also in, in, in important to see how Hegel has a take on Kant. So he criticizes some of the formality, but he says, well, nevertheless, with Kant we have a new kind of subjectivity that is so radical somehow as as Descartes' cogito is radical because. Uh, it's it's um, it's the it's the su it's a subjectivity that has a new understanding of what conscience is about, and this also makes us clear what when when Hegel makes this reference that that, that that the principle of Kant's moral moral law is somehow the principle of the French Revolution. It's for Kant. It's for Hegel. Excuse me. Really, something absolutely radically radically new. Kantian ethics has nothing to do with the Aristotelian concept of the good life. It has nothing to do with pragmatics. It has nothing to do with utilitarianism. It has much to do with individuality uh, and with with well with the call of the moral law. But the but the source of this this call is somehow the subject uh, herself. I think that's about the idea. Yeah. So to turn to the first main chapter in the book, which focuses on Kant more thoroughly. One key term that comes up throughout the chapter is disposition, or more specifically, the revolution of disposition. So to start things off here, can you unpack the function Kant sees disposition playing in his theory of the subject and how it will feed into his ethical theory? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, well, I, I try to make the long story short. Uh, long story short. My, my thesis is that Kant presents us in his ethic ethics with a kind of theory of split subjectivity. And this brings me, of course, then later in the book to my, to my third chapter on Kant and Lacan. Uh, well, what do I mean with that? Uh, well, I mean that for Kant there is somehow a divine-like or even devilish-like force in the individual subject that is responsible for our moral acts. And, and this force... And this evil force or, or holy force cannot be put under control, even not under control by reason itself. And this sounds, of course, very strange, since many academic communities working on Kant would say in general, well, that Kant's ethical agency is all about reason. And reason is universal. So why am I focused on this, on this force that is somehow super reasonable or beyond reason? And I do so with, with reference to, to what Kant calls, um, as you said, uh, or as you mentioned, the disposition or what he calls the revolution of disposition. He also calls it sometimes a change of heart. These are all figures of thought for him, but I think Kant uses them to express that for him in moral acts, the human being is overcome by what he calls also in another place in the, um, the, the horrible voice of the moral law. And uh, so what I'm interested in is how he describes, uh, in what kind of metaphors he describes the moral law, and that he says, well, the, the moral law cannot be betrayed, but is some, it is somehow something alien in us, in the subject, that even the subject cannot really truly dominate and not dominate even by reason. So the, the source of this voice cannot be po positivistically be determined. Uh, but if so then also the moral law cannot, of course, itself not be determined. Uh, but if morality cannot be trained, and this is also, uh, as I said, a key aspect of Kant's moral philosophy, then we are somehow back to the paradox of autonomy. Well, and because you could ask, well, who speaks? Who is the, the author? Who is the voice of the moral law? Uh, what is it? Yeah, where, where's, where's the, the final source of the subject? Uh, from which this voice is coming. And I would say, well, the, uh, in Kant's pers perspective, it's the moral law itself that it, that, that, that calls upon the, uh, the subject. Uh, but, it's, but, it's, but it comes from 
the 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 inner split of subjectivity itself and this is i think what he what what his concept of the revolution of disposition stands for in that sense this is i think the point where the split subject comes in because the, the revolution of disposition doesn't explain anything it just explains well there is something beyond in me that can overcome me and and maybe then we have moral acts it's also interesting that Kant says that we can never be sure that we have done any any moral act in our entire lifetime because, of course, we have never an insight into the motivation of our moral acts. Uh, but nevertheless, so the, 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 the what he calls the, the disposition is somehow, for me, the entrance to develop uh, in a, a, a theory of split subjectivity. Another key theme that runs throughout this chapter is temporality and the way certain ethical or maybe supra-ethical acts function to disrupt a certain chain of events, both shuffling our past as well as our disposition towards our present. So can you unpack what Khan is getting at here regarding time and temporality's relationship to ethical acts? Uh, well, as I said, uh, the ethical act of agency uh, can disrupt somehow ethics as the the discipline that normally conforms to, uni to 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 the universal law. I mean, ethics is normally defined as the as the research into 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 the, the establishment of values. And for example, in discourse ethics, we have this kind of uh, we find our values uh, via the the debate between free moral agents. And in general, this. This is what we would call that that ethics is about. Uh, but as I said, I'm more fascinated with this Kant who somehow crisscrosses ethics from his concept of of, of an excessive subject of, of of moral agency, and this is and this is of course a subject that you never see somehow in the in the big Kantian literature on on Kant. For example, you have discourse ethics who integrate Kant as the moral author of of reasonable debate. Or you have, um, this would be the, the Kant of, uh, of Abermas or Apel discourse ethics. And then you have, for example, Kant as the big author of the, also the autonomy of the reasonable subject, uh, interpreted by Christine Korsgaard, who links somehow Kant's concept of reason and morality back, and autonomy back to, to antique philosophers. And you have, for example, Brandon and, and, McDow uh, and McDowell as philosopher who, who see Kant as some kind of pragmatic philosopher. But what I'm interested is in that what these schools see is that in, in the heart of uh, in the heart of Kantian ethics you have not only ethics but you have the 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 ethical agency. You have what what I call the ethical. And this how this is somehow always some of this overtaxes uh, the political reality or it overtaxes situations. And maybe I can I can give a I can give a, sh a short example of what I what I of what I mean with these kind of uh, ethical agency because sure uh, take for example uh, political subjects we know from the last uh, years uh, like Julian Assange or Edward Snowden I mean uh, we all um, know what what uh, their agency was like and I think when we focus on these on this uh, excessive subject, we see somehow immediately um, also again the paradox of autonomy that we were talking about. Because with regard to these authors, we have uh, to ask us if the deeds that they were known for, you, you remember leaking classified information to the public, if these um, acts were morally good or morally, morally, morally reprehensible. And one could say, well, on the one hand, we have uh, Kant, the defender of the state, who would say, well, send them to the send them to the gallows. I mean, treason is never an answer. Uh, but then you have uh, Kant, the defender also of the moral law, who, who might say it's it's up to the voice of the moral law, and as up uh, and as such, up to the individual if this individual wants to grant this voice a hearing. And what's interesting, so 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 it's difficult to say to say, well, what. Can discourse ethics give an answer here? I would say it cannot. Can pragmatics give an answer here? Neither. Um, because you have these irresponsible subjects uh, who who somehow crisscross uh, the, the standards of 
uh, of uh, what is valuable or, or what is normatively acceptable from the perspective of the state. And also, as I said, for Kant, the perspective of the state is absolutely essential because he would say we cannot start the state, the, the state from scratch. But nevertheless, in Kant's moral philosophy, he gives the individual the, the, the basic source of even putting into question the entire world, though not on, not on a practical level for, for, for the establishment of the state, but on, on a theoretical level when he focuses on, on, on what is, the mor what is mor morality all about or moral agency. And, and, and uh, we, we see in these cases that I just mentioned, uh, Assange uh, and, um, and Edward Snowden, that there, is, that there is no yes or uh, yes or no answer to the morality of their acts. Because you always have good arguments for these acts. I mean, who, who would deny that, that they were, these acts were morally very good? But I would say every, every argument is confronted with an, a counter-argument that I, can ima I could imagine that, uh, that if you have Edward Snowden arguing with his, his girlfriend, should he do this or not? Should he risk his personal career for this, for this debate? Uh, I, I think you sh there, there will not, not be a final answer. If it comes to the subject, him, her, himself or herself, then really to, to, yeah, to, to act out what it perceives as uh, the moral law, even if, uh, even if the subject himself or herself doesn't have a final argument for it. And I think this, this, this is a quite an amazing description of what the call of the moral law may be like. It might be a law, it might be a call that you, that you, that you even do not really hear clearly, or it's only an emotion, or it's only an acting out. Uh, and, and this is essential and this is essential when we talk about Kant, Kant's um, formal description of the moral agency. So that it is somehow mono, monolithic and not dialogical. So the subject in, in, a, in, these, in these situations might, might be thrown back on herself or himself as the only source to say, well, I have to, I have to take the risk because the future might uh, give me the reasons. The future might give me the reasons, but I have to bet my excessive subjectivity onto this future. And I think this is what the ethical stands for in comparison to what ethics is about. Ethics is about discussion, preconditions of discussions, give many people the chance uh, to debate what, what they want. But the ethical is, is looking of what the, the preconditions of the debate leave out, that, that there are always preconditions. And uh, and this is so. In that sense, the ethical crisscrosses ethics, uh, and I think one can make Kant responsible for this uh, for this radicality. To close things off with Kant, the subtitle of this chapter is "The Split Subject of Ethical Agency," which comes up in the form of a certain tension you refer to throughout the chapter. You read at one point, "quote." Kant was truly aware of the radicality of his position and very consciously wanted to leave a possibly insurmountable tension between the spheres of right virtue and the moral for the sake of the impossibility of integrating the ethical into ethics. So to close things off here with Kant, can you explain this tension he has in his ethical theory between the ethical and ethics in how this tension should actually be seen as a feature rather than a bug. Okay. Uh, well, this refers to, to what I said uh, just some minutes ago, but I, I, maybe the, the following example helps. Uh, think of a judge in court appointed uh, by the public. I mean, uh, in a way, the power of a judge is, as we know, to incarnate somehow in excess of law that is that is part of law itself. Because compared to an always limited number of paragraphs, uh, we know that uh, life situations have an unlimited or number. So we only have, we only have a certain number of laws, and the certain number of laws, laws is confronted with, uh, uh, with, with, with the flow of life that, has, that is unlimited. Uh, this is why we have judges. Uh, because we would say um, this, the authority of law cannot be done or enacted by computers or machines because we need to understand the flow of context and then apply the algorithm of a law 
to, to a certain situation. But nevertheless, it is so, so in that sense that the judge's decision to cut into, into the law or into the flesh of the culprit and into the tradition because finally we, we need some kind of jurisdiction. And this is, of course, for, for our society, no problem. Every juris, ju, juridical system functions like that. So we grant the judge an excess of power because compared to a limit, limited number of, of laws, we have an unlimited number of situations. Now, to repeat my point, I think Kant's radicality is this, that he grants this authority to the individual subject confronted with the moral law. Uh, and and in, in a way, it's, it's the formality of Kant's imperative or of his categorical Im imperative uh, that is uh, that is of important because it is exactly that because Kant says well don't, let's let's not so much look on on the context but 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 let's look on the formal on the formality of a maxim that we are trying to get to. Uh, so again, we see the difference uh, to Habermasian project of discourse ethics. Uh, because there's always the, the talk about the recognition of free responsible agents. Um, but um, the ethical is, as I said, with the example of the judge, it's, it crisscrosses the, the limited standards of what is perceived as, as uh, what ethics is about. Uh, the ethical somehow is a surplus power of, of ethics and, and, and in that sense has the ability to question what, what e ethics seems uh, or uh, of, of what eth ethics defends as what is most valuable and most universal to to ethics, and in, in that sense, it's it can be truly devilish, uh, not even what Kant calls radical evil. It can be devilish evil. It can it can be, be uh, it can um, be encounter it can counter every intuition we have of morality, and I think this is what what Kant uh, refers to. Next, you turn to Hegel, who, fairly or not, has often been accused of having a sort of totalizing and, in some cases, totalitarian worldview. Uh, but you come out against this view. Early in your chapter on him, you bring up his critique of Kantian formalism, although it's not just that he thinks Kant is wrong, but fails to develop his theory fully. So can you unpack Hegel's critical development here? Uh, yeah, well, one can say with regard to the to the uh, to the case of totalitarian world, we, one can one can say that well, Hegel has at least two con concepts of Geist of what he calls spirit. Geist is for him on the one hand, let's say the sum totals of our norms of uh, rituals, societies, uh, the codex uh, juris that a society has. This is one form of what the spirit is for Hegel all about. But then he also talks about uh, World spirit, or uh, no, not only world spirit. He talks about um, spirit as the sum total of what the, the history of knowledge is all about. And uh, and you all often you have this cliche that um, that Hegel somehow is a pre-Kantian philosophy philosopher because he has this concept of Geist as if Geist would be some kind of godlike entity. Also imagine we can think of this kind of Weltgeist as uh, Take the movie The Truman Show, where the director of The Truman Show lives above the props of reality in, in some kind of netherworld. And, and sometimes uh, one, has, one has the impression that uh, uh, there is this stereotype of Hegel who thinks um, Geist or spirit as, as this entity beyond uh, the, the realm of phenomena. Uh, but what I'm interested in, or I think or what is absolutely uh, important, is that Hegel says, well, what he calls spirit is always in the process of its becoming. And so there's never the, the end point of spirit like God that, that pulls spirit, spirit into the potentiality of its being. Uh, but it's rather that spirit itself also understands itself retrospectively through all the horrible history that, that spirit has left behind in, in mankind. But important is that, uh, so it, important is that what spirit is, is spirit only retrospectively from the from the position of that it is right now, for example, right now in the 21st century. And uh, for Hegel, what is important in this case is that, that he needs these kinds of subjects uh, that he is uh, fascinated or that he presents in the phenomenology of spirit 
because there we have these subjects that ha that somehow incorporate what he calls uh, what he calls uh, uh, the, the 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 Kantian moral the Kantian morality or what he under, what he understands as conscience, because he says uh, that while Kant speaks of so the split subjectivity or the, that's the way I interpret it in his moral philosophy, Hegel somehow takes the split subject of moral of the moral of moral agency and transforms it into the, the, the motor, into the engine of, of what for him ethical life is, is about. So and that, and, and in that sense, uh, what Hegel understands as spirit is always the spirit in, in, uh, being confronted with, with moral agents, with moral agents, and these moral agents bring, bring spirit in its normative framework on the, on the brink of collapse. And that's the way for Hegel that, that, that spirit progresses, progresses through the centuries. So in that sense, uh, spirit is not can never be absolute in that sense that it that it already knows what's coming. Spirit somehow is confronted with is confronted through as, uh, excessive subjects with what it could not have even imagined. And this is fascinating because now you have somehow this idea of of Hegel as a materialist. It's not that Hegel when he talks about and this also of course. Uh, uh, an interpretation that is very much uh, that I that I owe very much to to Slavoj Žižek uh, and uh, the Lacanian uh, Hegelian schools and Lacanian school uh, who who really focus on the materialistic dimension of what Hegel calls spirit. So spirit is experiences in world history, and spirit doesn't know what what will what will be next. But this is what Hegel focuses on. So that we that's why we have forms of negativity. That's why uh, spirit uh, is always is always conf confronted with its own non-being. And I would say that excessive subjects are, are the motor in this. And in that sense, he takes the Kantian split subject of moral agency and transforms it into what for him ethical life is about. Ethical life is about spirit. But through excessive subjectivity, it's, uh, subjectivity, it's, uh, it's ethical life, which with confronted with ethical life cannot yet understand, but only retrospectively when let's say these excessive subjects have have entered the future and from that perspective on give us the chance to to see truly what ha what has been missing in the past right now for example in the 21st century we can, we don't see what has what's missing uh, because we are always interested in maintaining the status quo but there's always of course too much antagonism that we don't see and and in that sense for Hegel's spirit is always the struggle of its own identity. It's always the struggle with the contingency of of history. And so its its spirit is not the guarantee of of being or the guarantee that the basic structure of reality is coherent, but it's rather that the basic structure of reality is, though it is normative and it's conceptual and it's it's uh, it's all what we can understand. But nevertheless, there's always a missing link. There's always a lack, and and excessive subjects can come through this lack and and be of importance and then show 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 spirit and guys that it hasn't understood yet its its own potential yeah kind of developing off uh what you've been talking about uh, one of hegel's most famous ethical examinations comes in the form of his study of the story of antigone you write quote what characterizes antigone is precisely that through her a detail emerges which as part of the ethical substance, brings this substance into a discrepancy with itself through a sacrilegious deed. So can you unpack the Hegelian deed in Antigone's story and how it brings to light a tension between the individual subject and the polis? Yeah. Well, as I said, my, my chapter on Hegel is, is, is called the, the Split Ethical Life and the Subject. And at my, my first chapter was called Kant's split subject of Ethic, ethical, ethical agency. And as I said, I, I think um, Hegel takes uh, Kant's radicality and uses it for his phenomenology. And, and in that sense, and in that sense, we come now to, to Antigone because Antigone stands for this uh, somehow split subjectivity or radical agency um, that is uh, of, of, of so much importance for Hegel in the phenomenology. Because when, she, when Antigone wants to, we, we know the story, she wants uh, to bury her brother, Polynikes, who, who fought against Thebes, and in that sense, fought against the state, and Cleon. 
we know that she that she brings herself in confrontation to the state. Or to say it different, differently, she somehow declares a state of emergency and as such brings Cleon truly in danger because of Cleon, uh, because of course Cleon cannot accept um, that this um, this act of defiance. And I think again we are very similar to excessive subjects that, that I just mentioned with regard to Edward Snowden or Julian Assange. We have here really subjects on the borderline between holy and being fanatics. And, and Hegel refers with with Antigone to to some kind of uh, fanaticism. Uh, and in that sense, maybe we come to this later, that in that sense I also try to underline in the book that these excessive subjects have to be paranoid in a way. They have to be oversensitive to what reality is about. They have to, they, they have to, they have to see something that the others don't see and that makes it, that makes it difficult for them to, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to make themselves comprehensible. And this is somehow, uh, what uh, what we see in Antigone. So when Antigone, um, because Antigone, the, her case is very interesting because Sophocles describes that when Antigone says, well, I have to obey the laws of the netherworlds, uh, I think you say netherworlds or Netherlands. Uh, um, I think underworld would be. Yeah, the underworld, exactly, yeah, underworld. So when Antigone, uh, Sophocles says there are, there are, there, there's an interpolation or a call by the, by the, by the laws of the underworld uh, but Sophocles also at the same time says, well, nobody knows where they come from. <laughs> so that's very inter interesting because you could say that Antigone uh, refers to a tradition, but she has no knowledge of the tradition because somehow the knowledge is lost or it wasn't, wasn't necessary. On the other hand, you have the modern state that I, I, I presume it's a little bit rationally. It's built on this non-describable um, law of the, the underworld or of the tradition of the family. Uh, so this is for Hegel a very fascinating case because um, uh, you could also say Antigone couldn't enter in the game of giving and asking for reasons. That, that's an expression that Robert Brandom uses. Uh, or Antigone couldn't get into discourse ethics uh, and debate and debate her argument because in that sense it's, it's her, her argument is bogus. I mean, she even cannot give an explanation of the law she refers to. I mean, you could say it's, it's feeling it's, or it's tradition, but I mean, that, uh, that's no argument. But, and that, that's so interesting, uh, but what she has is, is, is conscience. Uh, and again, I think we are here at, at, a, at a category that cannot be integrated into ethics uh, because it, conscience is, uh, is uh, conscience is, is she has, Certitude. She has conviction. She, does, she doesn't need an argument. A little bit the same. I mean, totally different situations. But I've seen. The, I would say the same with Assange or Snowden. You, you have these. You have these um, subjects. They have. They have conviction. They can give arguments, of course. Also, Antigone could give arguments. You, 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 we should respect the tradition. But these arguments have no have no force on the on the on the on the realm of giving and asking for reasons. Um, and in that sense, uh, we see Antigone here as as this as the surplus power of of normativity against the state. And and Hegel is fascinated by this because he says, well, she is right and she is wrong. Uh, it doesn't say Hegel doesn't say, well, it's brilliant, uh, Antigone, uh, go for it. Uh, you are absolutely right. No, he's, no, he says that's the drama. Um, Cleon is right and Antigone is right. Uh, so, and and, and uh, it's just it just explains how. How spirit in this case struggles with an with an inner antagonism and it doesn't have an answer, and then we have uh, the next stage somehow the the Roman law in the phenomenology where some of these traditions are now are, are absorbed and integrated. But um, but at first the most important thing is to, to to realize what I would say that Antigone somehow is is paranoid. She she hasn't. She has a sensitivity, she has a conviction, but she cannot explain it. She perceives something that the others don't see. And here again, we are, I would say, in confrontation with split subjectivity and when, with the, the antagonism between the ethical and ethics. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor of the New Books Network. And you probably know what VPN stands for. That's a virtual private network. And what it does is it protects your privacy and security online. The best VPN service is ExpressVPN. 
That's the one I recommend. And here's something that you may not know about ExpressVPN. You can use it to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. So I know that a lot of you are stuck at home right now due to the coronavirus, and it's only a matter of time before you run out of stuff to watch on Netflix. Well, I ran out, and this whole week I've been using ExpressVPN to binge on Doctor Who on UK Netflix. I'm a big Doctor Who fan. And it's really simple to do. I just fire up the ExpressVPN app, change my location to UK, that's the United Kingdom, refresh Netflix, and that's it. I get to watch Doctor Who. See, ExpressVPN hides your IP address and lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose from almost 100 different countries. So just think about all the Netflix libraries you can go through. If you like anime, you can use ExpressVPN to access Japanese Netflix and be spirited away. That was a pun. But it's not just Netflix. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service. Hulu, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, you name it. There are hundreds of VPNs out there, but the reason I use ExpressVPN to watch shows is that it's ridiculously fast. There's never any buffering or lag, and you can stream everything in HD. ExpressVPN is also compatible with all your devices, your phones, your media consoles, your smart TVs. I have a smart TV, and more. So you can watch what you want on a personal device an iPad or something, or you can watch on the big screen. Now, listeners to the New Books Network can get a special deal if they go to expressvpn.com slash newbooks. Go there, and you'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. So support the New Books Network, watch whatever you want, and protect yourself with ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash newbooks. Yeah, you were kind of alluding to Antigone's possible, like, mental state, and you end the chapter on Hegel with a discussion of madness, and elsewhere discuss schizophrenia, although you understand it differently than we often might today. Rather than seeing it as a condition that requires institutionalization, you write of it as a phase of or a necessary step for the subject to take in order to get to a new level of subjectivity. So can you unpack this understanding of madness for us? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. When uh, when I refer in the book to schizophrenia, I use the term in a, in a certain interpretation. I mean, there are probably libraries on, on the topic, uh, but I, sh- I use a certain interpretation um, presented by Marianne Krühl uh, in her book on the topic. And she, and she, I think she she finds she gives a very nice interpretation. She says she she defines schizophrenia as the inclusion of society's antagonism into the emotional world of the schizophrenic subject. So, um, what? So that's I think that's a nice description. So the schizophrenic subject somehow absorbs antagonism that that is always out there in society. There is no society that is in antagonism free, though. Of course, there are there are unconscious structures who. Who by definition have to suppress these antagonisms, otherwise, otherwise you would go mad. Um, but the, schizoph- the, the schizophrenic somehow absorbs these so, these um, these antagonisms into its uh, into the, the emotional world. But not only that, Krull also shows that the schizophrenic lacks repression capacities. Uh, but of course, as I said, these these repression capacities are absolutely necessary for our mind to diminish the confrontation with apparent contradictions that, that we see in everyday life. Um, and in that sense, I would say um, I would say somebody like Antigone uh, is somehow um, is somehow paranoid or schizophrenic because she sees the contradiction in the polis uh, that is some something fundamentally of importance for for uh, for her. Uh, uh, she sees the contradiction of the polis and she cannot repress this contradiction. That's very different from her from her sister Ismene. Ismene can she she doesn't she doesn't care, but uh, but Antigone she cares. She cares too much. And again, we are confr- confronted with the with the situation. Why 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 does it happen that some people care and other people don't? Uh, why is it that Edmund Snowden cares or Julian Assange? Uh, and 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 their colleagues who have maybe the same background, they don't. And I would say, I, for for me, I only can say it. Well, they have some kind of oversensitivity, even some kind of schizophrenic paranoia, that they that they that they that makes them that makes them in the, well that individualizes them and also isolates them. And you always can ask them, well, aren't you oversensitive? 
aren't you irrational? I think, and all these arguments against them, I think, are valid. Aren't you overtaxing what you're seeing? I mean, why, I don't know, why leak these informations when the state is so important? And especially now after the Cold War, we have new st power struggles. Why do you want to, to confront the state with, with this antagonism? Uh, why, why can't you let it go? But I, I, th I think um, schizophrenia in the definition of Marianne Krull gives a, gives a, gives a good, good definition, at least, that these, that these uh, individuals take the antagonism of society as something personally as something personally on their body. And in that sense, they have to act out to get rid of this antagonism. And other people don't. Yeah, so that wraps up Hegel for us. So finally, turning to Lacan, you start off by drawing connections between politics and psychoanalysis. So if I can quote you at length to kind of bring us in here, you write, quote, interiority turns out to be a foreign body for Lacan invaded by an other. It stems from a semantic field that, because it is overdetermined, always overtaxes us. This other in the own often prevents us from finding peace in our dreams and accompanies the subject throughout her life. It also concerns the political order in which the subject lives as Zuan Politikon, since she expects this order, among other things, to compensate for her own shortcomings. The subject is haunted by an insatiable insistence of desire to be inscribed into the political order that, for its part, renders itself impossible due to its own deficiencies, end quote. So in this passage, you've given us a summary of a lot, but I mainly wanted to read it to help introduce listeners to the overlap of metapsychology and politics, namely the way things like desire and lack overlap with politics and the polis. So to prepare the ground a bit for this final chapter, can you speak to the relationship between these two fields as you and Lacan understand them? Uh, yeah, of course, because as you said, these are totally essential because of, of course my, my goal is then to connect these rather political philosophers now with, uh, with the, the, the theoretical frame of psychoanalysis. Um, to give, give some introductory remarks, one could say that Lacan gives us in his philosophy, uh, some kind of an inner psychological topography of how we as subjects are interlinked with the, the society that surrounds us. Uh, and of course, he is not the only one. I mean, that's a topic, uh, the, the, entire, um, the, the entire research on phenomenology is, uh, is, so is, is focused on this. But uh, Lacan has a very nice expression for this intertwinement between, between politics and, and the individual psyche. Because he says in the famous quote, the unconscious is out there. <coughs> so, excuse me. Um, so the, he says the unconscious is out there. And, and with this uh, proposition, he, sa he, he tries to get rid of a misunderstanding that we have from the, un on the, from the unconscious. Sometimes we understand or we interpret the unconscious as some kind of inner psychological cellar or basement uh, where we have our cadavers, uh, the dead bodies or imagine, imaginations, um, suppressed desires and aggressions and so on. And Lacan breaks with this image. He says rather that the unconscious is uh, a, a door not to our cellar, but to the, to the big, what he calls the big other, to the superstructure of our social life, of, um, you know, of our parents, of the institutions that surrounding us. And and I th I think this is a nice entrance to understand what what this uh, what is uh, this proposition says the unconscious is out there because because now the unconscious is also uh, representative of what uh, Lacan calls in another context the big other so that's language society enigmatic calls and we are always in this kind of in this in this inter structure of interpolation of um, of what society wants from us. Uh, and this is something that gives my concept of excessive subjectivity an important inner psychological framework, of course, uh, because I want to, to understand what happens when subjects act out against their fellow human beings and try to reframe their desires. So Lacan tells us, well, our desires are always, are always interlinked with the desires of the others. But, uh, but so in that sense, he... Um, he um, uh, he follows interpretations from uh, Louis Althusser on interpolation, 
because I mean, in that sense, Lacan is not saying something new. Uh, but on the other hand, and against Althusser uh, says, well, of course, we are a subject by definition interpolated subjects. We have to obey to the law and we have to accept it freely. But on the other hand, or, or, or beyond going beyond Althusser, um, Lacan also says, well, the subject is always always more than what the interpolation was. So in the, there's always a missing link in the interpolation. And that is something that uh, Althusser did not focus on. Uh, but for me, the, of course, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is essential because it gives me, the, it gives me uh, a tool to interpret what excessive subjectivity is all about. It is, it is part of an in interpolated structures through a social framework that gives us certainty for our everyday life. On the other hand, uh, Lacan shows us that uh, interpolations have always an, an enigmatic remnant, something where, uh, where, the, the, where the call of the big other or the call of society always misses us uh, or we misinterpret the call. And so we, we don't, we don't uh, devolve into the big other like water and water. There's always, there's always a, missing, a missing encounter. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, this, of course, is, is for me important uh, to, to get something out of this missing encounter as the source, uh, where also then finally the excessive subject finds a free, a free space to disconnect himself or herself uh, from, uh, the, the, from, what's, from what society de defines as reality. Let's turn to Lacan's understanding of the subject. Um, one of the themes you pick up is Lacan's adoption of Freud's Nebenmensch, or fellow human being, although this isn't to be understood in the typical way we understand a friend sitting beside us. Instead, it's a sort of alterity within us that helps constitute us in our reality. So can you unpack what Lacan is getting at here? Uh, yeah, uh... Well, Lacan takes the concept of the Nebenmensch from a, a famous uh, text from Freud, early text, the project for scientific psychology. But it's bizarre, Freud only men mentions very briefly, briefly this context or this, uh, this concept Nebenmensch and then, uh, and then uh, Lacan makes something with it. So in, in Lacan, one could say that the Nebenmensch is mentioned at first as some kind, as some kind of source of alterity for the newborn child. And Lacan develops then this concept further, underlying how, through this kind of enigmatic encounter with the with the with the fellow human being, the subject somehow is the subject's life is conditioned through this enigma. So, um, to give an example, one could say that the Nebenmensch, in general, let's say it's first the parents, but Freud says, well, as I said, Freud doesn't say a lot, but Freud nevertheless nevertheless mentions the parents, but uh, experience in a different kind, for example, the mother crying. So there's something that that, uh, that, that, that the toddler or the child is irritated, irritated in the parents. Uh, okay, but what, where, do, where do we go with this? I think what this brings to is that it's not that the parents exclusively open the world to the child in what, for example, many philosophers, but also Donald Davidson calls triangulation. So the child then learns concepts and words and so is integrated into the social world. For Freud and Lacan, it's, it's, it's not, there's not so much the interest how the child is introduced into the, into the world of rationality of social order, but how the, the, the subject or the, the, the child is introduced via the enigma of, the, of an other. The enigma that has an effect on the child's desire because the child wants to know what the other wants from him or what, yeah, what's the desire that what, what does the other see in, in, in him or her. So, and, and there's also, I mean, this is, this is a, big, a big topic in Lacan's theory because he says that the unconscious of the child develops always in relation to the unconscious of the parents. So the parents may not, they may, they may not know themselves what kind of enigmatic message they are transmitting uh, to, to, to their children because they might not even know on what kind of fuel of desire they have been living there their life um, with regard to their parents. Uh, but this, for, for Lacan, this is essential. So the, the Nebenmensch somehow is the source of, of an enigma, and this enigma is important the way we relate to our desires or we, and in, in the way we relate or interpret what we perceive as the desire um, of the other that wants something from us. Uh, but it just underlines that, uh, that 
that there is more in the subject than only rationality or understanding concept or giving giving and asking for reasons or knowing how to to play the the field of language uh, the subject the subject is more than than rationality it is it is it is it is overtaxed it is uh, it is uh, it's confronted with an enigma and it somehow has to deal with this enigma and and this enigma might be very positive but it might might, might also be um, disastrous in a way if the the subject uh, cannot liberate itself uh, from from something that it never understood at, at, from the from the start. Another key theme for Lacan is interpolation, which gets developed a lot in his essay in the Acre, the subversion of the subject in the dialectic of desire, where a subject emerges as a response to a particular sort of address and finds itself embedded within a chain of signifiers albeit always with a certain stain of traumatic irrationality. So can you unpack this dynamic of interpolation for us? Uh, well, uh, Lacan develops this uh, this concept of interpolation in the so-called uh, text that he calls the, 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 subvers the subversion of the subject that you mentioned. Um, I... I explain what happens in this in these um, interpolations uh, to my students uh, with an anecdote that a uh, that a comrade of mine, a fellow Jesuit, uh, told me once, and I think this is very insightful, uh, because he told me that during weeks of prayer, when he was making his spiritual exercises, he remembered one day a sentence from his father, and, and what his father said was, uh, and I quote, "I only respect the Jesuits." When I tell this to my to my to my students, there's always a laugh, um, because on the one hand you could say, well, it's totally unimportant what the sentence means to the father. The, again, the quote: "I only respect Jesuits," but it's obviously, or it was obviously, not unimportant for for this Jesuit, for the son who has become a Jesuit and, and remembers now the sentence during his spiritual exercises. Uh, and what is so interesting, for at least for this subject, I would say, is that he could ask himself, "Well, was my was my whole life story built on a missed or a misinterpreted message? Have I become a Jesuit because, uh, in that sense, I wanted I wanted to gain respect from my father? Because of it, it, it is, of course, absurd uh, to to remember situations like this. Because you could really ask yourself, "Well, what's the what's the message? What have I?" And, we, and in that sense, we are back to the enigma. What kind? What did I interpret? What did I hear? What was the message sent? And maybe the the, the father uh, wanted to express a totally different or contingent idea, but not in that sense uh, animate the, the the individual to become a respectful Jesuit, for example. But but uh, another uh, and that at that sense, uh, Lacan also refers in this text to. To the quote "Que voy," uh, often very famous uh, in Lacanian uh, literature, uh, he takes this from uh, a novel from Jacques Cazot from the 18th century. But I, I give you a, a last example that I also give my students time and again. Think of, uh, also because we are still asking what kind of traumatic irrationality can be in interpolation, and uh, an example that I give, for example, think of. Uh, Prince William, Duke of Cambridge. I mean, we know him, the, 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 the son of D Diane. Uh, he obviously stands in the call of the House of Windsor. And this call is something Prince William has to subjectivize himself to. Because, well, the House of Windsor does not want Prince William to play the role of that prince, so to act like an actor, but the House of Windsor has to get into the unconscious of Prince William because it wants that Prince William wants to be Prince, Will, Prince William by himself. But again, and in that sense, you have somehow the big other. It's very stereotypically speaking, the big other is the House of Windsor. You have this toddler, this newborn child, Prince William, and then you have the whole story of interpolation. But again, you could say, well... Um, there is, of course, also an enigma in this kind of call. You would, we would say, well, it's absolutely nice to be Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, but why? Why, why should we, why should we expect accept it? I could imagine that Prince William himself ask ask himself time and again, why do I have to 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 listen to this call? Um, and I, and I think these uh, these two examples might uh, might given might might explain what interpolation is about. 
at how there's always an enigmatic remnant that that throws the subject back on her on herself uh, to question and maybe to relocate herself with regard to this call uh, and the the, rec the call could also be by the entire society and in that sense also refer back to herself or himself and question the entire call Lacan saw subjects as functioning within various types of discourse, but the one you focus in on is the discourse of the hysteric, which not only plays a large role in his own therapeutic practice, but has larger ethical and political implications as it has a very destabilizing or potentially liberating or emancipatory function. So can you unpack Lacanian hysteria for us and the role it might play for an ethical or excessive act? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Lacan dis distinguishes uh, four discourses. He calls them the discourse of the master, the university, the hysteric, and the an an analyst. And I have friends of mine who've, who who question the entire concept, uh, but I don't want to I don't want to um, explain them too too deep. The basic, in that sense, I was want to immediately focus on the discourse of the of the hysteric, because again, we can explain this discourse of the hysteric with regard to Antigone. Because what defines the hysteric by Lacan is that the subject, as the hysteric, questions time and again the totality of, of knowledge as represented by, for example, the polis or the political order and the subject is surrounded by. So it's the world uh, of norms and, uh, and, and so on. So the hysteric is defined as the subject who always looks or sees or is affected by a lack in being. By a lack in the in the totality of knowledge, and uh, and this therefore questions time and again uh, the factual knowledge. And, and I refer to Antigone because, of course, she questions uh, the authority of uh, of Creon of the Polis and says, "Well, there is something missing." Lacan calls this uh, object of missing ob object object petit a uh, object small a, uh, and he defines it as the uh, the conditions of our of our of our being to desire continuously because we can never get to this object uh, but but nevertheless the, the hysteric object is uh, is is in a way obsessed with the lack of knowledge and that's also a little anecdote that's why lacan calls hegel the most sublime hysteric because when when you read the phenomenology uh, you see that spirit as depicted by hegel is this structure that is always uh, missing itself and is always fascinated or always uh, re-energized by getting back to well, well, what's now missing and how can we, how can we go beyond what is missing? Uh, maybe to to loosen up a little bit the, the debate uh, again, uh, an example of my personal life. Um, I live in a Jesuit community uh, in an apartment in time and time. Time again, I have some arguments uh, with a friend of mine who lives in this apartment also because uh, he he reads every day uh, the most important newspapers in Germany. They are called Süddeutsche Zeitung and Frankfurter Zeitung. And uh, and when he reads these papers, then I would say a little bit polemically, he repeats all the opinions that he just read about. Uh, uh, so he absorbs, let's also polemically speaking, somehow the opinion of the big other as from one to one. Is, is he in the position of the hysteric? Of course he is not, because for him there's there's never somehow a doubt on the side of the big other. He takes it he takes it more or less at face value. And when we have the debate, or when I question this in that, in that sense, I am the hysteric because I don't, I always see somehow the lack of what's presenting me in, in national media. Uh, and I think this uh, this might explain what what uh, what hysteric subjectivity is about. That you are that you can be even be neurotic in always seeing the missing link, while it might be more easily or uh, or more desirable to to relax and accept what is presented to you as that what is factual. You turn to Lacan's idea of traversing the fantasy, originally a therapeutic term that indicates a rather intense reorient reorientation at the level of subjectivity. You then develop it as a way of understanding a variety of historical and political events or temporal ruptures, 
So can you unpack this traversal and how it gives us a way of understanding major shifts in history? Right. Well, as I said, uh, when we are interpolated by what are, whatever the symbolic order, the law, uh, the institutions we are, and we become subjects, we are always some. We are always subject in a fantasmatic framework. There are fantasies surrounding us. For example, uh, I have a fantasy about myself, Dominic Finkelde. I'm a, I'm a professor. There's somehow a fantasmatic framework regarding this. I'm a Jesuit. I'm a German. So I have, I have all these layers of my identity uh, as a social being. And these layers have, have fantasmatic structures. Because there's always a, a fantasy, um, a fantasy incorporated in these in these layers. For example, when when I when I celebrate, when I celebrate mass as I'm a priest, there's of course an entire fantasy framework that's good, that gives me this authority to do these things. Um, so I'm not only acting as if I were a priest. No, no, I'm 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 taking in the fantasy that I am the priest that I am, or that I'm the professor that I am, or that I'm the the doctor that I am or the judge or whatever. Uh, and that's important because our roles, this is what Hegel would call our second nature. So the social roles that, that are put on top on our biological natures and the biological natures are our material bodies uh, or animal bodies. But our second nature is put on top and intertwined with these biological bodies. Uh, but they, they are maintained also by fantasy. Now, what traversing the fantasy is, at least that's what I what I understand. Uh, I'm not sure if that's all what can be said, but what, what for Lacan traversing the fantasy is that it can happen that you have the impression that the phantasmatic framework you are in is not that you can that you can fill, and then it might be very difficult for you uh, to get rid of this phantasmatic framework because it doesn't only well you're not only getting money uh, through being a professor or a doctor or a judge. But you also enjoy the phantasmatic framework of being this judge. So you know, I'm not acting as a judge or as a doctor. I am this doctor, and this gives me this gives me enjoyment, a political enjoyment, because I have a force. I can I can I can I can call I can I can speak in the name of the law of the people. Uh, so I understand that Lacan says, well, it might be absolutely difficult to get out of these second natures. And and, and, then, and again, let's let's refer to to Edward Snowden as an example, because I, well, I, I refer to Snowden time and again because I've written an article exactly in, on him on how can he can be interpreted as an excessive judge subject. You could, we could say that he worked for the NSA and was also a part of a phantasmatic framework of what it means to work for such an important state agency. And now we know that he acted out against this, uh, this entitlement, but he remained alone in doing so. And I would say that he traversed in that sense uh, a fantasy. He, t he traversed a fantasy that was, for, for example, at least for his colleagues, at least nevertheless very important. And as, and, and as I said, it's not it's not as easy that we can take our second nature and and exchange it with another because it is inter intertwined with our with our biological bodies. So tra traversing the fantasy is reinstating the, the framework of my subjectivity, and it's not that I'd, I I can change it like I can change a, a jacket, a blue jacket from to a to a white jacket. It's a it's more than that. It's 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 a paradoxical situation because I have to liberate myself without knowing where I'm where I'm going to, and I think that this is what what traversing the fant what traversing fantasy is all about. So, re re reinscribing myself in a fantasy that is not yet proven. To close off our discussion with Lacan, you turn to Kierkegaard, interestingly enough, as well as Zizek, and your understanding of discipleship as a response to a particular sort of calling. So to take us through to the end of the text, how does excessive subjectivity function in relation to a call coming from a particular sort of authority? Uh, yeah, well... Birkegaard has, has written a, a very beautiful text, uh, and I can re recommend uh, everybody the, to read it. It's called uh, On the Difference Between a Genius and an Apostle. Uh, and it was Zizek who interpreted this text brilliantly um, because he linked it with uh, Althusser's theory of inter interpolation. I think, so what's all about this? I think that 
That's what I'm trying to get now. First of all, Kierkegaard is interested in the difference of the authority of a genius and an apostle. That's the title. And he says that what he calls a genius has a message that can be understood or transmitted uh, to the disciples of the, de of the genius. Uh, and it can be, un also it con can be con understood conceptually. And now he makes the difference to the apostle because he says, well, the apostle has also a message like the genius, but what the, the apostle has to say cannot be absorbed and understood. Uh, one could make the difference uh, or explain the difference uh, in the vocabulary of analytic philosopher. And one could say, well, the genius speaks in propositions that have a truth value. And the apostle speaks in propositions that have not a truth value, but these propositions nevertheless have a message. So now everybody would say, well, it makes sense to follow the genius because his message can be understood, but that's not the point of Kierkegaard. The point of Kierkegaard is to say the message of the apostle will have a bigger effect because the, the message is incommensurable. It's incommensurable. It is. Um, it it has an effect on on the on the on the apostles, but they cannot absorb it. They cannot absorb the message in in the imminence of their world experience. And another aspect is that I only under understand. And this is also what Shijek focuses on brilliant brilliantly in his interpretation of this Kierkegaard uh, text. That I only understand the message of the apostle when I when I leap into. And when I leap into the horizons of of what he is talking, how to explain? It. When I leap, when I leap with a with an act of faith, into the position from which the message is articulated. Uh, it, this does not mean I can reduce the message of the apostle to a list of propositions. Uh, it rather wants the point is rather that I can only understand uh, the message from the horizon that the, the apostle himself opens up. The, the, the hermeneutical horizons of understanding. In that sense, we need this kind of leap of faith as, as the precondition final... of deciphering what the message is. Can I, can, I, can I repeat this? Yeah, of course, Steven? I thought you were done. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead. So, the, so the, the leap of faith is the precondition of deciphering the message of the apostle. Uh, and again, this brings us to, to excessive subjectivity because these we ca we cannot even we cannot the, the excessive subjects cannot make us ex make us understand why why we have to follow the, them. We have to 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 jump into the, the hermeneutical horizon they open up. Uh, as a final question to wrap this all up, you've given us a theory of subjectivity that can get enmeshed or caught in a particular set of morals, values, or ideological trappings. But you've also argued that the converse is that we are always in some finite way capable of breaking out and beyond our immediate ethical horizons. Given everything you've just developed for us, how would you encourage listeners to go forward and think more critically about their place in a current political moment and how they might in some finite way stretch beyond it. Uh, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, at first one, one has to accept that we as subject are always inclined to be uh, submissive, to, submissive to obedience and, uh, and, to the, and to the society and to the law. That's, the, that's our preconditions. And it would cause too much mental stress to question time and again the normative framework we uh, we are confronted with. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think it is important uh, to reflect on the fact that normally we are somehow uh, always a step ahead of our obedience because we take the, the social reality as 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 a firm ground of what is of what is granted. Uh, the status of facts, and uh, what what the book uh, tries to show is that we can dis dis disrupt or in interrupt this this uh, first step into obedience uh, to the law, and in that sense liberate ourselves from this um, dependence of what is presented to us as factual. And I think excessive subjectivity can be a source to to um, and, and interpret what we what we mean. To liberate us ourselves from this interpolation. 
All right, that brings us kind of through the whole text. So as a final question, what, if anything, are you working on now? Uh, well, I'm working on a book where uh, I try to bring the certain philosophers of what is called today materialism, materialist dialectics, uh, in the dialogue with philosophers of the analytic tradition, especially with philosophers uh, like Donald Davidson and John McDowell, because I, I think there's still need to relate uh, these very radical philosophers with other traditions of philosophy, and that's what I'm trying to focus on, especially in the context of uh, of the understanding uh, of conceptual schemes and if there is some kind of lack of being or a gap of being. Because analytic philosophers, or the, the ones I'm presenting, would say, no, there, there is no gap in being, and the, folk, the philosophers that I'm interested in, like Zizek and Badiou, the time and again focus on this lack of being and that's what I'm working on to get this conceptually right how they these different schools um, uh, differentiate themselves sounds very fascinating so Dominic Finkeld thank you so much for being with us yeah thanks for the interview <laughs>